All right, we are starting and welcome back to the podcast. Today we have Melly Grant, the voice actor for I got some I got some titles here. We got Smite, Apex Legends, Tiny Tina's Wonderland and Dragon Ball Super and plus many many more. Hell how, yeah. how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, good to You've done your research. I, I do come primarily from anime uh, initially and video games, but mm-hmm. um, I've started to work more in the in the video game realm since getting to LA. And obviously, this has been a wild and crazy and terrifying experience these <laughs> past two weeks. <laughs> uh, did you just recently move to LA? Yeah, I got here back in May. Mm. Um, I actually booked this from Texas. I'm from New York, so I, yeah. I rep Brooklyn no matter where I am. Um, and I was in Texas for the past four or five years. Um, I got my BFA in drama at university, um, at NYU in New York. And, uh, I ended up in Texas because at the time it felt like the anime world was a little easier to sort of get started and cut your teeth. The barrier of entry is a little bit lower so that, you know, you're not competing with top tier, insanely brilliant LA talent all the time. It's a little easier to kind of get in, start to get some practice, start to level up your abilities and and work from there. And the cost of living in Texas is way, way, way lower. And I had actually just come off this 10 year career running as far away from acting as possible. And I was just turning screws for a living, fixing computers. At Apple. Yeah. Uh, for- one reason or another, yeah, maybe it was just fear of change or fear of of diving into the arts. But uh, I was looking at, you know, the savings that I'd put aside, living in New York, not having a child, not being in a relationship for the most part, you know, and I could certainly spread, you know, stretch them a lot further in Texas. So it was, it was kind of like a, st- a strategic decision of giving myself as much time to not have to be working 40 hours a week and just be able to focus on building an acting career. Um, and I was in the process of thinking about moving back out, you know, moving out to LA and giving it a shot out here. The anime world was sort of hit or miss in terms of where they found places to use my voice. Um, you know, and and politically, Texas and I have our differences. <laughs> so I had been looking into moving to LA and I'd been talking to a few different people and trying to find a way to get out here as soon as possible. And then I booked Apex and I was like, well, if- if I've been waiting for a sign that maybe I should be working in this market, like I'm probably not going to get a bigger one. So I should probably pack up and just get the hell out here. Yeah. Um, how how was that? Was there any fear in the the you know, you talked about 10 years at Apple. And is there any fear in that decision to take that leap to voiceover? So much fear. I graduated ages ago and I got my BFA in drama and initially I'd, I'd gone for theater and then eventually I started looking into stage and screen, I'm sorry, into screen acting, television on camera. And um, I tried it, I didn't really like it, but this was all like, so, you know, the character catalyst is trans, I'm trans, and this was all pre-transition. So to be completely honest, it's kind of hard to find that line where like, you know, the the, the self exploration you have to do as an artist and, and to resolve to make that decision to live a life in the arts and to go for it, come what may. And the line with like that inner turmoil of self discovery that comes with being trans and and making the decision to transition, that line gets a little blurry. So I'm sure that that probably played into my, it, it, it at least made it easier to not bother trying to be an actor for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and I definitely, hit a point in my life and career where I, I was sort of reconciling this idea that thank goodness turned out to not be true, that if I transitioned, that probably meant just like throwing my hope of being an actor in the garbage and that there, you know, there would just never be a place for me to, to do that kind of work again. Um, and it really sucks to have to like pit your love and your passion against, you know, what I knew I needed to do in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm so happy I was wrong about that, even though it took me a little bit of time to get there. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I figured, I mean, obviously asking the question, is there fear is kind of like, it's kind of just setting you up. Cause I know, I know there is fear in every decision, but like, like that 
it's a lot especially when it's something not guaranteed as as a voice actor like there's got to be fear every day like whether something is nothing's guaranteed so yeah yeah, yeah i can speak on that yeah so so there was i'm sorry yeah i lost i lost no, my way and just good. threw it for a you're second good. but um so there's definitely there was fear with regard to the transition aspect of it but then there's also just that that fear of jumping into a life in the arts and knowing that there are no guarantees Absolutely. and it often is the kind of thing that you have to just love it more than anything else in the world if you're going to dedicate your life to it and mm-hmm. and there are going to be these dark nights of the soul where it feels like nobody is giving you any looks, you know, nobody's giving you an opportunity. And there's so much temptation to compare yourself with other actors, even though we all come from different places, we've been in the game for different amounts of time, we face different challenges. And so it's, it really is impossible to, to compare your career path to any other person's, but we do it anyway. And we use it as an example to feel bad for, you know, feel sorry yeah. for ourselves. Um, so I, I'd hit a moment in my life where I thought, you know, I'm happy fixing computers for a living, right? Mm-hmm. And then that caught up with me and I realized I had to do this, but I was terrified. So I, it was so funny over the course of a 10 year career, I, I worked so hard to get that job and I was so proud when I got it. And for about five years, I was thrilled. And then for the next five years, I was miserable. And I think a lot of it was that fear of change. And my, uh, my joke, it's like half of a joke, was that I was on, uh, I was prescribed this medication at the time um, that I'm no longer on, but it was a really bad fit. And different medications can mess with you in different ways. And this one made me so depressed all the time. And I didn't realize it because it's like when you get hurt that pain, like your brain tricks you into thinking like, my hand has always hurt this much forever. <laughs> and, and then when it's gone, you almost don't remember what it felt like. Um, so I was feeling awful all the time and in a weird, awful way that, that almost gave me whatever the opposite of courage is to finally quit <laughs> and step away. And then the, the prescription lapsed and I was a little late on re-upping it and suddenly everything changed and I was fine again. And I was like, what? No, what happened? What, what was this doing to me? But it, you know, and, and please, I hope that whoever's watching this doesn't feel like that's the only way to take a dive into the arts. I would say that was the mo- hello chair going down on me. <laughs> Praising. <laughs> um, you know, that, that, I pray that no one else has to have that experience because I feel like that's like such a, a bass backwards way of getting into yeah. the arts. But I quit, I moved across country, and I gave it a shot. And after 10 years, I would be lying if I didn't say that there was this small, arrogant part of me that was like, this is going to be a fairy tale ending. I used to take classes all the time, and I always got really good feedback, and, and I had mentors in my life encouraging me to, to, to move to LA and to take it seriously. And Thank goodness they were patient with me because I took so long to make up my mind to actually give it a shot. I'm going to get down there and I'm going to be a star, baby. <laughs> and it was so far from the truth. No one gave a sh- shit about me. Can I curse here? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no Say one gave a want. shit about me when I moved down and like, nor should they, because who the hell am I? Yeah. Um, and over the course of five years, I had some really cool opportunities. Dragon Ball Super was amazing. I played Catella in that, the god of Universe 4, as well as Magikayo, uh, who was one of the villains in the tournament arc. Um, and I, I got that because I auditioned for a role that like I had no business reading for, but I tried anyway. And I didn't book it, but then he thought of me for this other role. And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't just like shot my shot. Mm-hmm. Um, Fairy Tale came out of nowhere, and, and Demaria Yesta was an incredibly important character for me because it was one of the first times that I just played a young woman in an anime when my initial work was very much, you know, I would get the big muscular woman or like a monster or mom or something. And so just playing what I consider like a regular ass anime character was very empowering and fulfilling to me. And actually, if you go back, Damari is such an interesting experience because I was still so new to rediscovering those things about me as an actor that used to be instinctual that I had to sort of reclaim and reintegrate because like 10 years went by and I basically forgot how to act. <laughs> um, that 
I feel like you may feel differently, but I feel like the early episodes are rough. And like I can watch myself learning almost on an episode by episode basis and kind of rediscovering those things again and making some piss poor acting choices. The later episodes I felt were a lot stronger. And actually some of those later Demaria episodes in the final season of Fairy Tale, pretty close to Catalyst. Mm. Um, so much so that the writer, Ashley Reed, when we first got into the session uh, and started recording for, the, for Apex, mentioned that she'd heard Demaria specifically and that that was one of those like touchstone characters of like, yeah, I like this vocal print. Hopefully we can get there. Mm. Um, so yeah, fair, you know, it's a lot of fear. And, and a lot of comparing and a lot of envy. And that's always something that we're fighting this uphill battle against as artists to kind of just focus on what we can do, what we can control, you know, and you can't control other people's success. You can't necessarily control the opportunities that are given to you to an extent. Mm -hmm. You can't control certainly what casting directors are looking for with any given audition, but you can control who you are when you show up. You can do the auditions that hit your desk. Don't you know, let fear get the better of you and let them pass you by. If something hits your desk, you say yes, you show up, you do the best work you can. And in this case, I'm not going to say that this always works, but with the Catalyst audition, this was a role that I felt in my bones was right for me. And I knew that I could do it, but I spent a bunch of money that week coaching with a bunch of different people that I trust just to make sure that like, I'm going to do the best work I can, but I want to spot check this with as many people as possible because something I can control is making sure that that, in, that audition makes as big an impact as I can possibly manage. Yeah. And well, holy crap, it worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so rare, but it actually worked. <laughs> what, about, what about the feedback that you've seen um, from just the sheer just like announcement of uh, this character catalyst like what has what has really um impacted you or left a print that you can share the well, last week, two weeks have been terrifying um it, needless to say this is the biggest thing i've ever booked um and so you know overnight sunday to monday everything changed you know and i'm not out here like running matt mercer numbers or anything you know but like Overnight, my, my follower base on Twitter like quadrupled. Yeah. And uh, the whole night before, I was terrified for so many different reasons, some of which are shallow and stupid. But, you know, new experiences are scary. And I, I thought about a lot of things. Like this character leaked a couple of months ago uh, initially. Mm -hmm. And I remembered the auditions talking about her as this terraformer who, who did work uh, with the landscape. It was very vague, but it talked about her doing terraforming work and having this found family. And so I remember going through, maybe you saw them too, those leak videos that, that, that popped up. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that it was probably Catalyst because I had booked a role. It was all codenamed. And I'm like, it's probably Catalyst. And man, she's the hot one. Everyone's looking forward to this character. And so you start, your brain starts playing tricks on you. And I'm thinking, well, I know this is going to be a little bit of an older character. This is not even art made by Respawn. This is just placeholder art that leaked from someone's art station account. So like this has nothing to do with what they're working on. But it's a young looking woman who's extremely attractive. And, you know, what if the character airs and she's like 30 instead of 18? And is that going to, you know, upset people if they've spent months looking forward to it? You know, or maybe it'll pull in a very different demographic. Um, is the fact that it's a trans character when everyone's been waiting for this new hot character like is that going to be something that then gets celebrated i hope um mm -hmm. you know or is there going to be a lot of people lashing out over it because you know that the, there were like all these characters that are leaked and if this is the particular one that you got attached to and it ends up not being what you expected i i hope that it's something you can learn to love and not something that you end up getting really angry about and so i was nauseous all night i didn't sleep at all um and then to my surprise, it's, it's been nothing but love. Um, I know it hasn't been love everywhere because I've gotten a whole lot of messages from fans, um, way more than I can possibly respond to. And I feel so guilty about that. But my, my inbox has been flooded with people telling me how important the character is to them and how meaningful seeing this kind of representation in such a big game, like a first person playable trans woman in a triple A video game is insane. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I hope it stops feeling insane in the future. But right now it feels like such a landmark moment. Mm -hmm. A lot of those messages also said things like, you know, I'm so sorry you have to deal with all of this crap on the internet or I've seen all these things and don't let it get to you. And fortunately, they haven't come for me yet. So I I simultaneously feel really bad that people are seeing these experiences in other places. I'm also secretly grateful that like it hasn't come for me personally. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's not lost on me how important a moment this is. And I think that creates this very intense feeling of responsibility, uh, with regard to how I use this platform and, and, and our ability together, like as the actor and the writers and the studio, you know, who I don't work for, I'm just a freelance actor, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like our ability collectively to create a positive impact with this and not just a moment in time that then disappears, but like create some momentum and serves as a proof of concept, both that trans narratives are interesting and people care about it. And that that kind of visibility and representation is meaningful to a lot of people. Even people that aren't trans might see parts of themselves in, in Catalyst's story. And then just from like the, you know, the, the cynical, business aspect of things that trans stories are marketable and sell and make money for these companies. Um, But then also a proof of concept that trans talent and non-binary talent can be just as competitive and work at the highest levels Mm -hmm. of show business and should be taken seriously as, as performers and given the opportunities that they deserve. All of that on my shoulders, super scary. (laughs) Because I am just a normal ass person girl from new york i am one person doing my best Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's been a blessing and it's been it's also that it i feel that responsibility and i take it very seriously (laughs) yeah i i love the fact that you said like this is monumental but at the same time we don't we don't want it to just be necessarily like just a one-off we don't want it to be uh every once in a while or like we want it to be normal for this to be going on but also like to be sitting here and knowing that you're representing such a monumental foot for it and i don't mean because i know how this could this could (laughs) be a cause of a panic later (laughs) i'm teasing yeah (laughs) Uh, but yeah it it is incredible i mean to sit here for me and to just watch respawn do what they've done because they don't they don't have to tell you anything about the like they don't have to tell you that the character's trans like no one's making them be like oh this character in a video game is trans or they're non-binary or you know x y and z they don't have to say that but they are because they they care about that community and they care about making sure everyone's included which is incredible by respawn because they know that there's going to be people there's ignorant people out there who are going to just turn away from them i mean but they don't care because it's way more important to them to yeah. to have the trans representation in in a video game which i think is incredible i appreciate that so much and and it's it's you know i'm not like not to try to subtweet any like specific previous games but i remember those moments where you know and uh, and I've, I apologize that this has been like the soundbite lately in a few interviews, but like it's been on, it's been so front and center on my mind how like so much previous storytelling when it came to representation, whether it was queer characters or whether it was POC characters, um, you know, uh, obviously it, 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 I should say specifically actually when it comes to queer characters and characters that, that, you know, like trans non-binary, you know, gay narratives are all we're often told collecting my thoughts we're often told through uh things like you know color palettes and like you know there would be like coding and the way a character dressed or specific vague things they said or you know in games it might be like an item that you have to like get a specific item and go to the lore tab and like you'll be like oh maybe this character you know, is a gay character. And that's like the most you ever hear about it. Uh, And looking back at some of those games in the past, when there would be like this one thing, like a picture in the background of like 
a, a comic that's like an adjoining thing to a major IP on a website somewhere that hints that maybe a character might be a non-binary character. And like at the time, revolutionary. And we were celebrating that. And then to see games like Apex come along and be like, you know, hold my keg. <laughs> and just front load so much incredible representation and these authentic nuanced characters that have these in-depth stories and man, they have, they have to put in work to do that too, don't they? Because in a game like this, where it's like a fast paced shooter, there are so only so many opportunities to tell stories yeah. and they try to hit as many grand slams as humanly possible in the very narrow amount of time that they have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's wild. And it's, it's a, we're in this place, especially with trans stories, because it's trans characters in particular are so few and far between when it comes to positive, meaningful representation um, that we have to walk this tightrope where I think that personally, and I can only speak for myself, personally, I think the best form of storytelling is when you can just completely normalize it, you know, and, and you don't need that big spotlight coming out story that's been done a thousand times. You know, I want to see a, a guy in line at the bank in front of the main character just casually drop like yeah the husband and i are going on vacation i just wanted to make sure they don't cancel our cards when we hit a starbucks mm -hmm. you know like that's that normalization that i think speaks to what we see a lot in real life um people like to paint i'm gonna get political for a second but people like to paint you know major city centers as like these like especially people on the right tend to paint these these city centers as like these these liberal places where like everyone has these different ideas of how the world should be when the fact is like it's just the exposure you know dude you're you're meeting other people you're having conversations with people who have perspectives that are different from you and you come around that's why we see so many politicians who might be the staunchest most bigoted people suddenly realize that their own child is gay for instance and suddenly it's like they have this big awakening because oh my goodness they now finally have exposure to someone who's different than they are <laughs> I would, um, I would love to, to butt in really quick on that because I grew up in a small town in the Midwest and is very one-sided of thought. Um, I grew up in Iowa and, and then I moved to the big city and not the fact that I felt like I had super strong beliefs in one end of e either spectrum, but it definitely did like completely sway in different directions all together and i i love that i never really even thought of it as i knew that my ideology changed a lot but like when you say exposure it, like it, that just it was kind of one of those oh yeah moments like i just i realized how correct you are in in that statement because it happened to me it happened to many people that i know it's just the more stories you hear and just everything of everything in between is just it's so helpful to your character to to have empathy for what other people are going through and just hear people out and just try to understand at the least of what someone else is going through you don't think about it if it's not on your radar right exactly. and i've had moments like that too um mm -hmm. because i transitioned and I'm a very binary trans person. I'm just a woman. I happen to be pretty masculine. I'm a tomboy, sure. But like, you know, it's, it's despite playing this like sultry, smoky character in the video game. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I, I, don't, I don't see myself as non-binary, for instance. And I've had moments where I had to learn because I would be uh, in communities talking to people and they would all want to start with their pronouns. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with that because I came from this place of, you know, my whole purpose in transitioning was to get to a point where people stopped asking me that mm. and just yeah. assumed right, right off the bat, I didn't want to do it. And, and eventually from talking to people and hearing other people's perspectives, I realized, okay, well, this is really important to you and is meaningful to you. And I have to take people's word, you know, and, and trust that people are coming to the conversation with good intentions. And if I look inside myself i realize it's not that big a deal for me to adjust and if someone is telling me that something's harmful for them or something's really meaningful for them i kind of do a little bit of internal algebra and realize okay you know what it's probably easier for me to compromise in this particular situation than them and if i can do that and it's really no skin off my back 
and it's very meaningful to them, that's a really easy change that I can make. Um, and I feel like, you know, we, we see that in gaming too. A lot of games, looking back, just kind of centered around this like regular old white dude. Mm -hmm. And they weren't harmful for me. I played the hell out of them. I, play, I, I was a Mac gamer growing up. So like, you know, the joke is like all we had to do was play Photoshop all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I play, I love Bungie games. I played Marathon to death. I played Halo for years. Um, I adore Destiny now. And, and games like that were fun as hell to me. And I didn't think about it. But it's almost like the missing vitamin you didn't know you, you needed. So I can play a game that's just centered around random white dude, for instance. And I can have a great time. But then when I play that game that actually gives me customization lets me play a female character or lets me design a character that that feels more like it speaks to who I am it's like something opens up like I didn't realize how much I needed this until I had it um and not everyone will feel that way I'm sure someone out there is like all those old games just cause me pain all the time but like for me at the very least like it was fine and then I realized how much more it could be mm-hmm Absolutely. Um, and now I definitely crave that, but it, it came like, I didn't know I needed it until it was there. And I'm mm -hmm. so grateful that, that, that games like Apex are, are like you said, choosing to, when they don't need to, you know, create a world that feels a hell of a lot more like the world we actually live in. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're celebrated for it by and large. And honestly, to, to see them then go even further to say like, you know, I mean, we're successful. It's like, it's not really a big problem for them. But like, to be able to say, like, forget min-maxing our bottom line, to use some video game terms for a second, like, forget min-maxing our bottom line. If you're not okay with that kind of representation in your games, get the hell out of here. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I, I also think it's, I think the reason that a game like Apex, or any game for that matter, who, who has characters that you yeah. would um, give you know the the label like trans or anything that you would actually come out and say i think it's so important for that because i feel like it's a really big teaching moment because not not a lot of people are going to have exposure to that and i know from when i started playing like valorant for example i was learning about different cultures like it was big representation of every part of the world you know, coming from like characters from Brazil, uh, just any any nook and cranny of the world, you know, there's some sort of representation. And I was learning about the cultures. I was learning languages and stuff like that. So I feel from experience that characters can kind of like subtly teach you without you even knowing. Like you're starting to learn their language. You're starting to, but like, I feel like that's where, stuff gets important because it is representation and it is teaching people whether they kind of yeah. know it or not like you're gonna get taught a little bit about you know proper stuff about that specific thing you know i've been there overwatch was that for me because mm. that was one of the first times that i saw you know a game full of just just characters from so many different backgrounds and like you know multiple languages like having like uh, line uh, uh character lines in their own yep uh you know nat their their own language um and when you love a character then like you kind of want to learn those lines and i remember spending time on like awful time on like google translate and stuff trying to make sure that i could like properly pronounce uh some of like anna's mm -hmm. uh, arabic lines because like i cared about them and i cared about I, I, I care about the characters and, and the fact that that extra layer of authenticity there is so, 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 so cool. Um, and I, I feel like there's often kind of, there's a, there's a misconception where like there will be people in the comment. I think there's a misconception that like there's some bad faith detractors will say that uh, they sort of create this fallacy where it sounds like there's one pool of money and it can either go towards telling good stories or towards like bug fixing when like mm -hmm. that's not true at all. And so you'll see people in the comments that are like, I don't care that this is a trans character or a character of color. Like, I want to know if the mechanics are good. And I'm like, yo, same. I'm a gamer too. I really hope Catalyst's kit is fire, but I'm also so happy. But it's also a different budget 
<laughs> they're not, you yeah. know, forgetting to put in a passive ability because they were too busy writing her witchcraft narrative. You know, like, and, and I hope that they hit both yeah. of those things out of the park, you know? Um, and there are also, you know, people who are going to fixate on, on her transness because that's, you know, that's something that's still, you know, something that we're, we're trying to, to create more visibility for in, in games and storytelling. And so I've seen a few people like fixate on the one moment in the trailer that she says she's trans. I'm sure they'll fixate on the, we have a couple of lines in game that reference it as well. Cause it was really important that we, we made it clear. We didn't want to leave it up for debate. We wanted yeah. it to be very, very clear that this was a trans character. Um, and some people will decide that that's all she is. And those people are missing the fact that she also has a group of friends she cares about a lot. And she's very passionate about witchcraft and she's in the goth scene and she likes crystal readings and she cares about the environment and she's, collateral damage to a natural disaster that happened that wrecked her home and she wants to try and fix that she's gone up to the moon to do terraforming work to try and stabilize her planet and create a better world and now she's frustrated and upset that it feels like her world is being exploited for the profit of some major corporation and she's been displaced and terminated and and her found family has is kind of scrambling to try to figure out what to do next and like there's so much more there and she's trans. It's kind of like when I send my bio to people, and this might be a place where I, I see myself in Catalyst, is I'm very similar in terms of, like, if I send my bio to people, I'll tell them I'm, uh, I'm an actor from New York who grew up. I got my BFA in drama from NYU Tisch. I uh, work primarily in animation and video games. I've been in this pr thing and this thing and this thing, Dragon Ball Super Fairy Tale, uh, Borderlands, uh, Wasteland, you know, uh, uh, Wasteland 3. Um, and I'm also trans, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I'm proud of, but it's also not the sole defining facet of my life. I've got my own problems and I've got my own triumphs in my career. I've got aspirations outside of my transness. And there is this sense that like, especially when it's an identity that, that you haven't had a lot of exposure to, you know, if you just watch the media, you might get this idea that, you know, trans people are just this group of really sensitive people who you know want to dye their hair and scream at people all the time when like the fact is most of us are like trying to make rent trying to get to our job on time so we don't get like our fifth attendance point you know trying to do rent and if we have another passion trying to make sure that we get all our crap done on time so we can get online and play games with our friends later or maybe work on that side project like just regular ass people yeah. and uh and i like when I think that's kind of the, the key to writing nuanced, multi-leveled, ca layered characters like that is making sure that you are writing them as a three-dimensional person. And so the fact that they're focusing on the fact that like, yes, like this is a trans character, but she's got hobbies. She has things she cares about. She has people in her life that she loves. She has people she has ideological differences with who she probably has to talk out her problems with. And that's all those things go into making her a fully realized character and not just like a checked box on like a representation checklist. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it easier for you when doing voiceover or I guess talk about the little differences of when you get a, a character that has a backstory that you find the voice for um, versus a character that you just kind of, I don't want to say it's just delivering lines because I understand that it's not like that, but a more uh, like one dimensional character that really is just kind of going in there and acting out the lines. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think many actors will tell you that we are just so hungry for more information and more context because the more we know, you know, the more we have to work with, we can tell a better, more compelling story. Um, and there are moments, um, I've noticed this a couple of times with different games where, you know, you might be going down your grid of lines and you might be telling one half of a conversation. And if you don't see the other side of the conversation, you know, we're not the writers, we're not the developers. And, and what we're doing is we're here to help solve a problem and efficiently help them tell this story. Um, and they may not have all the pieces ready, like things may still be in development. And one of the trappings you can fall into is when you have less information to work with, you do sort of start to just sort of pull on, you draw on characters you've done before, like, okay, this is a cowgirl character, so I'll, 
I don't have a whole lot of information to work with, but I have a cowgirl voice. Here's the cow- cowgirl voice. Or, you know, if you don't have a lot of context, uh, you, you know, you don't see the other half of a conversation or you don't know the bigger picture of what's going on, you might fall into a pattern of like delivering catchphrases or you find a really good melody that sounds good. Like all of your lines kind of, you know, start here and then end on this button. And then you just find a really nice melody that you know is going to sound good, but you're sort of just working with whatever you have. And it's always going to be more compelling the more information you have. And, and, and I think one of the things that made the, the first trailer, that lo- Last Hope trailer, so wonderful to work on was that we had a full script and I had someone reading with me. So I was actually able to have a scene partner and have a conversation with someone so that that you know, it wasn't uh, Anjali Kunapanani who plays Margot. I was working with the director, but the fact that they were still willing to read through the lines with me and give me someone to play off of made it so much easier to slip into character and just live in the moment and and be authentic to what was going on in, in that scene. There are definitely lots of projects you work on. Anime is notorious for this because you're you're working on such a tight schedule. There's only so much prep you can do where you just have to show up and be ready to turn out a great sounding line as quickly as possible um and we do the best we can and hopefully we tell compelling stories and and the the work you know the the lines hit and it sounds great but it's kind of like it's our job as actors to show up and just create this really solid foundation but then the more you give us the better that product will be you know we start adding awesome toppings to the pizza (laughs) and uh, and it becomes better and better so if you're in the you know if you're in the world of trying to create you know, work and you're going to be working with, with, with voice actors or, you know, with actors, storytellers, um, the, the more we have to work with the better. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I, I enjoy the, the more complex characters in video games. Like those are always my favorite games. Like, I don't know if it's subconscious because I just have more information to work with, but it, It just happens to be that way where I get a character and that just becomes my favorite game. I just love that. But also I do want to, by the way, when I get in the session, like, (laughs) because there's only so much they tell us. So I'm in there going like, I'm, I'm fascinated to learn the fact that that catalyst is this sensitive, caring, soft, sort of like unassuming character in the initial trailer. And then like freaking Batwoman shows up to the apex games. I want to know how she got there. And and so I'm looking at the relationship with Margot and the fact that there that there's some kind of undertone there that then gets curtailed because Margot drags her on this weird suicide mission. And, you know, is this someone who a lot of the self-exploration I've done, which may not be cano- canonical lore, but it's the homework I have to do as an actor is, you know, this is a character who transitioned early when she was a teen, but... I've my voice changed prior to transition, so clearly so as catalysts. And so why did she wait until her voice changed? <laughs> you know, and like we're living in a world, the world of of the Outlands is is a world where bigotry doesn't exist. That was something that we, they they hammered home really quickly is that like transphobia, bigotry does not exist. But that doesn't mean that you still don't grow up with a certain amount of fear in your life and and worrying about making a major change like that and how that might affect your relationships with your family and friends and having to completely redefine how you relate to everyone around you is still going to create a sense of fear. And it's possible that she didn't want to put the people in her life out. And so she kind of just tried to deal with it. And then maybe at a certain point, her voice started to change and she went, oh crap, I have to do this now, you know? And then she builds this relationship with Margot where she almost, it feels like she's supplanting her own wants and needs with those of this friend she looks up to. And so somewhere after losing Margot, she's had to go through this journey of self-discovery. And by the time she enters the Apex game, she's for the first time, maybe, you know, defining herself on her own terms. And she's a much more cold-hearted person. I think that there's a heart in there. I hope there's a heart of gold in there, but she's a much more grim, intense personality. And there's clearly been this defense mechanism or this coping mechanism put in place to protect her. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm very fascinated to know if we, to see if we get to continue to explore like how she went from this person to this person that shows up in the games. I'm sorry, I cut you off earlier. Please continue. Well, I was going to just praise you because 
I felt like it was such you turned in a great performance for the the trailer and I don't think voice actors hear it enough like your performance was great and I I'm so excited to see the performance through the character in game and uh what they do afterwards with little stories from the Outlands shorts I'm I'm so pumped for that um but I just want to give you props for how it was a it was a great trailer and i'm i'm super excited to see the rest of your performance thank you so much this character means so much to me um and and is i'm i'm i don't i'm sure you've heard other actors in this game say this uh many of us not all of us but many of the 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 actors working on apex are playing characters that are just very very close to home Mm. um and are very much in in kind of like the core of our natural range and and voice um, you know, obviously Justine, you know, puts on a dialect for Watson and, you know, um, Anjali Bamani doesn't sound anything like Rampart if you talk to her in real life, but a lot of us sound just like our characters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and so as someone who's faced a lot of adversity trying to build a career for myself, and I've been told a lot of times that, you know, my abilities as a performer notwithstanding, it's hard to find a place for my voice. Um, and so having a character like this resonate and having and in like the most selfish way possible seeing people like in the comments and in in discords and and in on streams talking about how much they love the character's voice is so validating and euphoric for me because that's that's been a place of sensitivity for me and so it's it's incredibly uh fulfilling and i don't know personally meaningful for me to see people actually celebrating the way the character sounds and enjoying the performance yeah it's something i've been self-conscious about a lot and so that's that's awesome (laughs) um what what has been your the thing you're that you're most proud of in your career (laughs) easy answer yeah um i mean I, i would the only other thing i would maybe say is is i you know, I went to school for stage and screen acting, and this was all before transition. And uh, and after I transitioned, I kind of had this crossroads where I had this is feels stupid for me to say, but there's no other answer. Like I had to figure out how to play women in stuff mm-hmm. because I mean I know who I am, but a lot of especially in the anime world, there are a lot of archetypes and specific like we have an expectation for what characters are supposed to sound like. Um, And so having to almost start over from scratch and figure out like, what the hell do I even play? Like, what roles do I audition for? Because in the past, I would just read for like, you know, whatever character was the closest to Edward Elric, you know, in Full Metal Alchemist, just some like scrappy textured young boy or something, because I've always had a high voice. Um, And now I don't know anymore. And so there, I, I would say I don't, I say this with like a big asterisk because I don't think characters should have to sound any one way. I mean, certainly that's been the cause of a lot of strife in my own career is people having these concrete expectations for how things are supposed to sound. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a result, you know, you're sort of I'm, me and many other uh, people with gender nonconforming e voices, androgynous voices, I guess you could say, um, sort of being like left on the shelf as a result of that. Um, anytime I've gotten to play a standard archetype, you know, so like, I'll just say like a normal ass. I say this with the asterisk because like, this is a little problematic, but like in the, the only way my brain knows how to process it, like a normal ass woman or a normal ass young guy, like that's very fulfilling to me Mm -hmm. because that tells me that my voice has a place in this work and that I can be just as professionally competitive and that I, and that I have a sound that people find compelling and want to hear. Um, And that's not to devalue the importance of playing a trans character like Catalyst. I think that they both solve two different problems. I think having a trans character front and center shows the world that there is a place for our stories. Mm -hmm. Um, But there is also something to having trans and non-binary talent voicing everyone's standard 
standard ass video game characters or animation character voices because that demonstrates that we don't just have to play ourselves and that we can give compelling performances regardless of what roles we're playing. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly have a lot of hope going forward that people interpret this character and listen to it for the performance and judge it on that basis. And hopefully, God willing, say, you know, damn, Melly Grant's a decent actor. Like we should get her into more games and not just as a queer character. Like, yeah, I'll play everyone's, you know, female soldier number three if they let me. Um, uh, but I mean, you know, so that I would say like from, from like a macro, like zoomed out perspective, anytime I've been able to play a standard like female archetype in a game, that's incredibly fulfilling to me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from like an even further top down perspective, I mean, like there's no denying this is the biggest role I've ever booked. And this mm -hmm. is like the most eyes I've ever had on me. So like it's probably the most important role at the moment. Yeah. Actually, one more thing I'll say real quick. I know I talk forever, but um. <laughs> I had this thought the other day and I was chatting with someone over coffee and it's, it's weird. Like if you'd asked me two weeks ago, you know, oh, you're an actor. What are you known for? I would probably have to say like, I, I guess it depends, you know, on what you're into. Like if you like video games, like I've been in Dragon Ball Super, that's pretty big. I've been in Borderlands. If you like video games, it almost feels like in the last week, my, I, I feel like it's like the new game plus on my career where like the slate's been wiped clean. I now have one character that anyone knows me for or gives a crap about and it's a great one so i'm grateful for it and yeah. i feel incredibly privileged to be in this position mm -hmm. but like it's like i've gone back to one noteworthy character and i guess i'm building outward from here <laughs> uh, um like, like what catella who even is that that's catalyst okay <laughs> i i heard you say that you were a big power ranger fan when you were growing up is this is this true oh I used to. I used to, dragon dagger, baby. What? Uh, I was also a big Power Ranger fan. But what did you watch? Like, a did you have a favorite? I guess like you know how there's like Mighty Morphin or did you have a? What was your favorite one of like series? I I mean I'm I I so I grew up with the OG series where they just took like you know Super Sentai slapped some awesome rock music on it <laughs> and and you know bricked the accelerator um and i adored that series i'm a huge 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 uh 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 jason david frank fan i would love to meet and hang out with him at some point someday somehow um and so i was i was just enamored of tommy in all of his iterations uh, i thought the green with evil miniseries mm. is brilliant uh, and then when he comes back as the original White Ranger, so powerful. Yeah. Um, but I think my favorite episode ever, and it's totally just a nostalgia, like it's just my nostalgia hit, was uh, I think it's called the Gold Legacy episode of the Dino Ranger series. Okay. Um, because they discover this, you know, like they've sort of transitioned, no pun intended, Tommy <laughs> into like the Zordon role where he's like the teacher who's training the next generation of Power Rangers. Mm -hmm. And they only know him as like their science teacher. I'm, I'm probably forgetting the specifics. Maybe he wasn't even that, but like they know him as their teacher who, yeah. who clearly knows enough about the, the mighty Morphin world that he can guide them, but they know so little about him. And then they find like this encrypted file that has his history as a Power Ranger. And then the whole episode is just this incredible montage of every role that Tommy has played in every series as like the longest running Power Ranger. Oh, the feels are so powerful in that episode. Um, it's so cool to see him go through his journey in one episode. I'm going to have to go watch that because I, I like just have this memory of that episode, but I, I'm also not having the full picture. So I feel like going back to watch it is going to be nostalgic. Um, so it has, if I remember correctly, it has some of those elements of like kind of roll your eyes storytelling where they're like, but then things weren't so good. And then it goes into <laughs> another montage. But just as someone, and maybe just for me at least, as someone who's been there, who, who like was there at the start to be able to see and just get like the greatest hits of Green Ranger, White Ranger, Red Zero Ranger, like and everything in between. Mm -hmm. um, also, I love, I'm a big fan of like the anti-hero, anti-paladin archetype. So seeing like the villain turned hero, um, it, Sega Genesis had this, uh, this like X-Men Clone Wars video game. Um, 
where you, after a certain point in the game, you got to unlock the ability to play as Magneto. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Like he sort of begrudgingly joins the team. I love that archetype. Uh, and I also love like the the sort of evil, dark counterpart archetypes. So the in the original series, the Doomsday two episode two parter, where they like Goldar, they build an evil Zord for him, and so it's not just like the Power Rangers in their mecha versus a monster, but they're actually fighting an enemy Zord like them. That stuff is so I find that stuff super cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can I can confidently say this is the first time I've talked Power Rangers on my podcast, but Yeah, I'm, you brought us here. <laughs> yeah, I'm not opposed to it at all. I used to You started this conversation. Yeah, Don't you backpedal on me. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I love it. Um one of my yeah. fa my fi favorite childhood memories is I used to have morphers and I and I don't I can't like remember exactly which ones I had, but like those were my fa I would do a thing where I'd, you know, it's morphin' time, and then I'd run back and quickly change into my Power Ranger costume and then come out. It was a pretty slow morph, but... Yo, the TikTok version of now of that now would be, like, the jump transition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Yeah, they released this, uh, the, the Legacy Dragon Dagger, uh, a handful of years ago at this point, probably, like, six or seven years ago, and it's heavy. But when they when they released the original toy, it was like made for child hands. Mm -hmm. So it was like this big and it had this tiny little baby, you know, baby blade on the end of it. And this is a little delicate, but the fact that they remade it and actually made it to the, you know, the right d dimensions of the original prop is super cool to me. And yeah. I keep it on my desk by the window. I, I'm terrified at some point that the sun will sort of stain it and discolor it. But I adore this thing. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I, I was super happy to hear um, that you liked Power Rangers and I couldn't wait to talk about it. Um, I love little props like that. I have I just got these recently. I haven't even unwrapped them yet, but I have glasses from uh, these are like little actor props. I have glasses from my character Buckingham in the yeah. uh, Room of the Rose King. He has these cool little spectacles and I got a prop of that. And there's no good merchandise for Catalyst yet, but I went on Etsy and I actually found some ferro fluid, real life ferro fluid. I have this. This is about the only thing that I really have from a video game, and it's Apex. It's the, it's Wraith's kunai. kunai. Oh, I love it. I, I am. I have a couple Apex Funko Pops too, but I'm praying that they. This is like totally selfish, but I'm praying that they create merch of this character. I've <laughs> I've never had like. Until maybe those glasses, like I've never played a character that's gotten a figure or like any real merchandise. I have this. I'm going to move my light for a second. I have this tiny, tiny little keychain of Catella that hangs from my light. But, you know, that's not the same as having like a brilliant, like $200 Figma figure. Um, so, yeah, in, in like the most selfish way possible, I'm just like crossing my fingers every day that they create some amazing piece of catalyst merch because i'm yeah. gonna buy the hell out of it <laughs> yeah i i would pick some uh pick some up too um i think i think that's a good place to stop i yeah. i appreciate you talking it was very fun um yeah and i i wish you all the best and i hope to keep in touch and see all your successes in the future and i'm rooting for you and i'm, I'm super proud of what you've done with this character and as well as respawn for for given the opportunity i i personally i mean i don't know who else was in the run for it and i'm sure uh there is lots of great people but i'm i'm super happy it was you who got this so we could have this chat and um yeah i, I appreciate you talking uh oh and well thank you so much for having me it means a whole lot that you reached out and uh and and i'm so glad that we were able to work out this conversation because this has been a lot of fun thank and you. uh and yeah i'm i'm you know i I'm so, again, I'm like repeating myself for the eighth time, but I'm just so excited that this character is resonating with people and, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm here for it. And, uh, and so I, I'm bracing everything for Tuesday because I, I'm, I'm so wildly excited to actually jump in and play. It's going to yeah. be so much fun to start maining my own character. <laughs> also, and I don't like, by the way, I think this is the first time I can ever, especially coming from anime, I think this is the first time I can ever say I'm just the official voice of something. That is mm. surreal. So 
this whole these whole past two weeks have been a weird dream. And so I'm so grateful to be here and I'm so grateful that we're doing this. So I hope we get to chat again at some point. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe we can play some Apex together too. Cause that, I'm, we, down. Yeah. I'm terrible. You'll have to carry me. <laughs> we, can, we can do that. Um, but yeah, uh, this, this has been Texture and Melly Grant. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace.